for this morning. Great song. How, how many of you wanted to get up right there and just kind of whirl around? You know, I, I, I get, we're going to be in Acts 9 this morning. I was thinking about that song as Rachel was singing it. and I just wanted to stand up and whirl around. I, I know that that is very unbaptist, <clears throat> especially very unmissionary Baptist. And, and we, you know, we, we have to, as a people, we have to be sure that and be careful that we don't get scared of the Bible, Bible words. We, we are so scared of the word dance, we're so scared of clap, we're so scared of raising hands, and yet those are all biblical terms. I, I listened to a, a pastor one time, and, and he was explaining a, a passage there in Psalm, and he came to the word dance, and he said, now that is a, as an, an old Hebrew word for a, a musical instrument. No, it, it's a Hebrew word that means to whirl about. <laughs> It has nothing to do with a musical instrument. It has everything to do with joy and possibly music, but nothing about a musical instrument. And, and, and really, I mean, the dance has the, the idea, have you ever watched your kids out in, in the sun? And, and they're, they're just outside, and, and pretty soon you see their hands out, and they're just spinning in circles. That's, that's, as far as I can tell, that's pretty much the literal, ver- the literal meaning of the word dance because it means to whirl about. Um, I listen to songs like that, and it brings joy to my heart, and it makes me want to get up. It makes me want to lift my hands. It makes me want to shout to the Lord and, and just bask in his glory as he, as he pours out his love. And, and what an appropriate song for this morning that, that he has been faithful and that his goodness is pursuing us. She didn't even know what we was preaching on this morning. Getting God good. <laughs> Acts chapter 9, we're going to pick up. I, I, I got tickled. I was working on Acts chapter 10 because two weeks ago when we had an iced up parking lot, I, I did this message. Well, I never could get the equipment to work. I, I couldn't get to record the sound or anything. And so after, after about six or seven hours, I, I just gave up. And, uh, but in my mind, I've already done this portion of the message, so I'm working on 10. And then I remembered, oh, we haven't even done this one yet. <laughs> and this is actually, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's simple. There's not a lot in it as far as heavy detail, but it is, it is a precious passage. There's two pieces here, and I want us to look at these, and I want us to talk about how God positions his people how God positions his people. In verse 32, it says, And it came to pass, as Peter passed through all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Luda. I know it doesn't look like that, but that's what it is. It's Luda, or Luda. And there he found a certain man named Ahinehas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Ahanaeus, Jesus Christ, maketh thee whole, arise, make thy bed. And he arose immediately, and all that dwelt at Lydia and uh, Luda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Father, once again, we ask for your blessing on this time as, as the preaching is done, that you would just give me fluidity of thought to, to share what you have and what you've given me and, and the things that you want this morning. Father, this is this is your time and place, and as is all time and all places. But this morning, especially, I want to honor you and and realize that this whole day has been about you. And whether we're teaching in the Bible study hour or the singing or the preaching, it's it's all about you. It's all about us, Father, coming and surrendering our will to you, and turning our eyes to you, and listening to you. And, and then celebrating that with each other, enjoying the worship and enjoying your word, enjoying the things that you give us and teach us. So, Father, help us to continue that and, and help me to be in tune with you. I pray that you forgive me of anything that's not confessed, that there's, that there's nothing between you and me, so that I can hear clearly what you have. 
Father, we pray if anyone is here or is listening later that doesn't know you as Savior, has not trusted Christ, this would be the day that they put their trust in Jesus. Father, we thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Peter took off just to go pass around all the different quarters. And the quarters is an ad in there for understanding. It means he just took off through all the regions around Israel. And remember, Peter is still um, focused on the Jews. That was his mission from Christ, that they took the gospel to the Jew. But now with the resurrection, we're seeing the transition to the gospel being brought to the Gentile. We're seeing the transition from where Israel is put on hold nationally and the, the focus or the gospel changed to reaching out specifically to the Gentiles. And, and we're going to see this in chapter 10 very, very intimately with Cornelius here in a little bit. And a lot of people teach that, you know, the gospel didn't go to the Gentiles until Peter. Peter opened the door to the Gentiles, but we forget about the Syrophoenician woman that Jesus offered salvation to when she asked for a touch for her child and he said it's not meat that we should give the master's food to the dogs not being a smart alley but just saying not to the house of Israel and, and she said even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table and Jesus told her your request is granted and, and she experienced the grace of God right there so and then we forget that the woman at the well was not a full Jew. She was a Samaritan. She was a mix. And because of that, she was out of the covenant. Her family was out of the covenant because they had inbred with Gentiles. So she was not a Jew, a proper Jew in the covenant. So Jesus is the one who offered the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter's the first of the apostles to do this. Paul will be the apostle to the Gentiles. So there's a lot of things that go on in these next couple of chapters here before the Bible pretty much, the, the book of Acts, turns almost exclusively to the apostle Paul. But Peter's taken a trip down through everything, so he's left Jerusalem, and he passed through Luda. Now, Luda is about 10 miles east of Joppa and about 22 miles northwest of Jerusalem. So if you kind of picture in your mind a little bit where Jerusalem is in the southern portion down in Judah. So you head up 22 miles southwest or northwest and you'll end up in, in Luda, Luda, I can't say it today. And, um, and so he's there where he meets Ahaneus and, and he just walks up to him. And this is just so great. This is so Peter. He's walking by and he sees him there. He's just cruising through the neighborhood. And, oh, hey, Aeneas, Christ has blessed you today. Get up, make your bed. Now, in case you young people were ever wondering about making your bed, you see what he did right there? He told him, get up and make your bed. Now, your parents can twist Scripture right there and use it for your kids to tell them they need to make their bed. That's not the point. But apparently making a bed is important. But he told him, get up, make your bed. So for eight years, he's been paralyzed to some level. Palsy means to be paralyzed. Um, one, or if somebody will check that door right there, I think somebody's trying to get in. Um, so it means to be paralyzed, and, and, it's, and it can be one or more limbs. And typically when you see the word palsy, it tends to deal with a leg or a foot. So we don't know exactly what it was that he had, but he had had a paralysis significant enough that he, he was in bed. He could not walk. He could not get up and couldn't go to work or anything like that. And so Peter heals him. Uh, Christ heals him. Peter says, hey, Christ maketh thee whole. Arise, make thy bed. And he arose immediately. He arose immediately. Did you catch it? He rose immediately. There's only one time in Scripture where the healing doesn't come immediately, and it's in Mark, and I think there's a reason for it. We don't have time today to go into all of that, but when you see all this stuff on TV and somebody heals somebody, and it's, it's a little bit now and a little bit later and a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and you know maybe they're, they come up in a wheelchair, and then they're standing, they're all shaky-legged, and then they kind of creep around holding on, and then a little by little they get, that's not how God heals. When you see that, that's not Bible. 
that is not the real gift of healing. And the real gift of healing comes with some criteria that the proof of the gift of healing is that you can heal anyone of anything with a word or a touch, and you can raise the dead. And I do not know a single, quote, healer today who will subject themselves to a biblical test of healing. And I don't know about you, but if I had the gift of healing, if I had the true gift of healing, there wouldn't be a lot of funerals in town. I, I'd just be cruising through the, through the hospitals and the morgues on a routine basis. Just, hey, you got somebody in drawer four? Yeah, well, open that up for me, would you? Hey, get up. Go get some clothes on. I, I wouldn't be sitting around and charging people to come get healed. I mean, this, is more, this is more like Simon trying to buy the Holy Spirit. I, you know... Th- when you have a gift of God, we're intended to use it, and it's not to try to get rich. Peter wasn't trying to get he just cruising through town. Whether or not this is because Paul is now moving about and he's following up to confirm that Paul is truly preaching the gospel, or if he's looking at Paul out and going out and thought, you know, this is probably a good idea. Jesus did tell us to go out and go from town to town preaching the gospel. Maybe I need to get back to doing that. We don't know exactly why, other than God put it in his heart to go. And so he's cruising through, and he sees this guy, and he just walks by and says, Hey, get up. Make your bed. Let's go. In verse 36, he says, Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died whom, when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. So give kind of kind of places here. you got Jerusalem, 22 miles northwest. You have Luda, 10 miles roughly west, directly west of Luda is Joppa. So here she is in Joppa. And it says that she is, she is a woman who was full of good works and alms deeds. Now, good is pertaining to being generous with the implication of its relationship to goodness. Now, goodness has several meanings, but this is the meaning from the Greek right here. And works is not the idea that, you know, the job that we do. But it is, it's similar in that it is one, that, that which one normally does. So it could be a job, but it's also just what somebody does what somebody normally does. So every day she goes out and she shows kindness to others. This is what she does. And then it says alms deeds. And the reason I gave you that, because I got to wondering, why does it say she does good works and alms deeds? Is there something specific here? And alms deeds means to give to those in need as an act of mercy. A charity giving to the needy. So she goes out and does good things for people because that's who she is. That's what she does. According to the statement, good, de- uh, good works, her normal life was going out and just being kind to people, helping people. But she didn't just help in general. I mean, she helped in general, but she also helped those with, through mercy. She helped those who were in need. So she wasn't just good to people. She wasn't just kind and loving to people. She also tended to those who were in need. She showed mercy to those who were in need. And it says in verse 38, as far as Lydia, uh, Luda was nigh into Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about traveling without modern transportation and without communication things like radios and Facebook. There wasn't a whole lot of social media back in this day. So we don't know all the time frame, how long this is taking. It's taking some time because they're either walking or they're riding a, a beast of birth of some kind, but normally walking. And so they hear in Joppa that Peter is 10 miles east. So words traveling around. You know, people travel between all these cities. Joppa is a, is a seaport. It's a natural port in, on the Mediterranean there. And so he's there. Uh, he's in, he's in Luda, and they hear in Joppa that he's there. It says, and they sent unto him two men desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter rose and went with them. He was, uh, when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, And all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. The word coats is not the same as our coats today. It means tunic. And the garments 
is just simply clothing and typically outer garments. So she was making the inner garments, the tunics that they wore, and she was making outer garments. And apparently her grace, and, her, and she was so well known for her love for the Lord and how she how she treated people, they were sitting there, they were mourning her, and they're showing Peter all of the things that she had made. Look at what she made. Look, look at this. Look at this coat. Look at this tunic. I, this tunic I'm wearing right here, she made this for me. Didn't even charge me anything. Can't you just see it in your mind, the scene, as they're there and they're sorrowful, and, and, and they're thinking, you know, who's going to take Dorcas's place? Who's going to be the next Tabitha? You know, when Brother Mike Rains died, I was talking with a group of pastors, and they said, you know, Mike was the, the pastor's pastor in Oklahoma. All of us young guys, when we, when we encountered things we weren't really sure hadn't encountered before, when we were struggling as preachers, we called Brother Mike Rains. He was wise. He, was, he had been down the road. He, was, he had great biblical wisdom. He had great advice. And we, called, and, and we were sitting here talking to him, who, who do we call now? Who's going to be the next Mike Rains? I wonder if maybe these ladies were standing around and, and maybe even some of the men were, were talking about who, who's going to take Tabitha's place? Who's going to step up and be the Tabitha? Who is going to step up and, and love on people like she does and tend to the needs like she does? Because I don't know about you, I, I can't sew a tunic. I have a hard time saying the word. And you don't want to see me sew, it's ugly. I, I did a needlepoint one time just to learn what Angie was doing and she Help me through it, and, and trust me, it didn't survive till now. It disappeared early on because it wasn't good. Who's going to take the place? We have people from time to time that they go home to be with the Lord, and there's things that they did. And who picks up that? Who, who, who goes on with that, that thing that they did? Who goes on being the encourager? Who goes on to be the one that gives the good godly advice? Who goes on to be that voice of reason when you're having a business meeting and, and, and you're wondering, you're asking questions, who's the one who's now going to be the voice that, that everybody turns and listens to because of their experience, because of their, their testimony for God? Who's, who's going to step up and take that place? And so they're showing him all the things that she made and talking about her and, and, and just, you know, I can just see them sharing now and talking about all the things that she did, all the lives that she touched. And, and then it says in verse 40, but Peter came all forth and kneeled down and prayed. And turning to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. Now, when you read this story, and you read these two events, I want you to follow what's happening here. I want you to see what God is doing. God puts it in Peter's mind to go kind of tour around and just check the different cities and see what's going on and, and just go be a witness, just go be a testimony of God's grace. And from city to city, so first he visits the towns. He ends up in Luda, just happened to be in Luda, where he heals a man. And word that he's there gets out to Joppa just happens to be that Tabitha died just happened that he's within 10 miles. I mean, that, you can do that. That's half a day walk right there. Not even that. In the Marine Corps, that's just a few hours without rest. God has been migrating him to where he needs him to be. Now he's in Joppa, and does that name ring a bell with you that he's staying with a tanner named Simon? Does that register with you? Because the very next chapter, we're going to talk about a guy named Cornelius who's in Caesarea, 22 miles north, and, and he's going to be told, send for Peter in Joppa. He'll be the guy's house named Simon who happens to be a tanner. God moves us. God puts us places. 
God wants us in the right place at the right time. And we don't always understand what is happening. I put in the bulletin this morning when, when Tom Messer was a, a junior pastor at in Florida, and he talked about this day, this crazy day that he had trying to get to the post office, and he had all these stops he had to make, and he was just detracted, detracted, and, and then came to construction and detoured and pulled in the parking lot just in time to, for people to come running out of the post office talking about somebody who was shooting everybody. And he was prevented from getting there for the shooting, but he was also placed there because not only was he engaged in getting authorities, he stayed right there and he counseled and he helped people. God put him there for a reason. He held him up getting there for a reason so he wouldn't be killed, but he put him there so he could be a testimony of the grace and the glory of God. And, and throughout the Bible, you will see people who, who seemingly are just somewhere, but you find that God has them there for a purpose. I can't help but think of Elijah when he has proclaimed the, the drought and he just happens along a widow who just happens to have a son who dies. He just, and, and you see Esther, who just happens to be taken captive with all the rest of the Israelites and just happens to be in the same city as the king and just happens to be the one chosen to be the wife of the king and just happens to be there at the exact time that Naaman decides Let's just kill all the Jews. I love what Mordecai said. Perhaps you're here for just such a time. Maybe this hadn't been all accidental. Maybe you're here for such a time as this. Ruth, she chose to follow Naomi back to Israel just happened upon the field of Boaz, who just happened to show up in the field and take note of her, who just happened to be a near kinsman, who just happened to redeem her and just happened to be in the line of Jesus Christ the Messiah. It just happens. It's all coinkydink, right? God moves his people where he wants it. Sometimes we don't even understand what is the, why we're here. Sometimes we go someplace and we encounter somebody and we go, oh, so this is why God put me here was just because of this, to meet this person. And, and then we find out later that wasn't it either. That was just a sideline to where God was leading us from place to place to place to place. Now most of us are planted here as far as living. God has put us here in Duncan for a reason. There are people here for us to meet. But don't think that the timing for where we go and how we go, whether it's in our own town or Deladon or Oklahoma City or wherever it is we have to run for whatever reason we have to run, don't ever think that that is just happenstance that you just decided all of a sudden that I need to go today. Don't miss the idea, don't miss the truth that God is sovereign and God works in amazing ways. And God shuffles us around for reasons. The change in our appointment times is not just happenstance. It may be that God needs you there because on this day, instead of the day you were going, is going to be a person he needs you to encounter. You know, not everybody responds to each of us. Not everybody is going to like the pastor. Some, some just tolerate the pastor. You, I, I'm amazed at how many pastors think every single person in the congregation has just absolutely love them, think they're the greatest thing. It's not going to happen because some of us, our personalities don't blend well. We'll love each other in the Lord, but it'll be like, eh. I can talk to somebody and get absolutely nowhere, and you can talk to somebody, and they will just sit and listen to everything you say because there's something in you that doesn't exist in me. There's a personality difference. There are things that I enjoy and that I study in life. I love science. I do well talking to nurses and physicians. I do well talking to people who like science because I can talk a little bit of what they like and bring that back to Scripture and show them where science fails and where Scripture is always correct. 
Every one of us here has a personality and a life experience that is different than all the rest. And there are people who we will be able to befriend and build a relationship that opens the door for us to share the gospel that nobody else can. We can share the gospel, we can open the Bible and try to talk to them, but we each have things that there's a certain type of people we will always have an inroad with just who we are. It's just how God made us. But if we're not aware of what God is doing around us, and we're just going through the day, we're checking off our list, we're just going through the day, we're just taking care of stuff, we're just doing whatever it is we do, and we are not mindful of the fact that everywhere we must go is an opportunity to share the gospel, an opportunity to meet the need of someone who is desperate right now for a touch of God. An opportunity to meet a brother or sister who is down, who is struggling, who has been through a hard spiritual battle, and they feel like there's no one else in the world who's ever felt like they felt, and we have the arm of Christ to put around them and love on them and encourage them and help strengthen them for the, for the fight. We have purpose. I, I am firmly believed if we could take the workings of God and, and put them into something we could conceive like a chessboard. I am firmly convinced if we could see God's chessboard, it would kill us. It would be so wonderful, so complex, so unbelievably layered that we would just simply die of awe. We have got to move out of God in our box and thinking in terms of what I do now, just day to day. God is, not, God is not like making every little decision for me. I'm just doing my thing. And understand that God wants to be in everything of our life. Folks, this is why he sent Jesus to die for our sins. Because he has something far better, far greater than anything we can come up with. And he wants to share that with us. He wants us to be with him eternally. He wants us to be in his presence. He wants us to be able to know him and to know of him. And that can't happen without the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not available unless we have come to Jesus and said, I'm a sinner and I need you to save me. Forgive me my sin and be my Savior. I put my trust in you, Jesus. I trust that what you did on the cross is all that's needed for me to go to heaven. And I, I quit trusting in me. I quit trusting in my good. I quit trusting in church. I quit trusting in mom and dad and in whatever else we find to trust in and just say from now on, I'm just going to trust you, Jesus. If it, you're it. I'm not going to trust anything or anybody else. If I go to hell, I go to hell trusting you because I believe you are the sinless son of God. You died on the cross. You know, when we reach that place where we can honestly say, I don't just believe it here, I trust it here. That's salvation. We make it so complex. We make it so confusing. Just pray for Jesus to come in your heart. How about if we just ask for forgiveness of our sins and put our trust, Jesus, I trust you. How about if we make it simple? Let's quit trying to flower it. Let's quit trying to, to, to alter it and just do what the Bible says. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession, agreement is made with God regarding salvation. The moment that I trust Christ, the moment I believe to the point I trusted, that is salvation. And then I'm supposed to open my mouth and agree with God that that's salvation because that's what God said. Easy believism? No. No. The idea that if I just believe in my head, I'm saved. No. It's a belief that drives us to a trust that acknowledges only God can pay the price that's required and I can't. And I have to stop just believing in facts, and I have to start trusting His salvation. Not easy to believe, oh, if you just believe this. Hey, there's a warning in the Bible that says you believe in the devil, 
or believe in one God, great. Even the devils believe and tremble. It's possible to believe the facts without trusting the truth. We have to trust the truth, but it's still that simple. I quit trusting in me. I quit trusting in good work. I can't be good enough. So, God, I'm just going to trust in Jesus. I just trust you. That's it. Because I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. I am undone. I am filthy. My sins keep me from everything. And I need to be saved. So, Jesus, I, I trust you. And I trust you to forgive me of my sins. Because I'm a sinner. That's salvation. Now, you say the word you want. You use however the word you want, a phrase in your own heart, but the issue is do you trust Christ for your salvation? And only Christ, because only Christ Jesus can save you. Only his blood, only trusting him. And if you haven't done that, I'm begging you today, trust Jesus. If you know you're a sinner, and listen, you're doing bad things, it's because you're a sinner. You think bad things because you're a sinner. We don't become a sinner because we do something bad. We do bad things because we're born a sinner. It's born, we're born with this stuff. And only when we come to God and we go, I am a sinner. I have nothing to offer, nothing I can do. Jesus, save me. I'm a sinner. I love the man at the altar. When the Pharisees, I'm giving all this, I'm so good, I tithe, I do this. And the other man is just pounding his chest saying, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Or the thief on the cross, no flirty words, no King James speech. Lord, he recognized who Jesus was, that he was God's son, and he was the sacrifice. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He just acknowledged he was a sinner, and he was trusting him. Why would you ask somebody something if you didn't trust them? Why don't you ask somebody so deep a life question? Remember me. You come into your kingdom. Remember what he told the other thief? Hey, what are you mocking him? We're here because we deserve it. He hasn't done anything. Recognize Jesus as God's son. He was perfect. Lord, I believe who you are. Remember me. In other words, forgive me, please. And then Jesus, this day will you be with me in paradise. You see, when we trust Christ, salvation is instant. It doesn't work up. It doesn't wind up. It doesn't come on little by little. You don't have to come down here and pray through for however long until you get something, some kind of juicy feeling. You just simply trust Christ and ask Him for forgiveness. That's salvation. And then confess. Agree with God. I'm saved. I trusted Christ. I'm saved. How come I can be confident? Because I trust Christ. The Bible says if I trust Christ, that is salvation. I'm totally confident. I have no fear about my salvation. I will be the most surprised person in hell if I get there because I trust nothing but Jesus. In this book, that I trust as God's word tells me, I've done what's required. I didn't have to do good. I didn't have to, I didn't have to you know, rescue 1,700 people and give $2 million and buy the. All I had to do was trust Jesus. I had to recognize I was an undone sinner and put my trust in Jesus, and Jesus saved me completely. Jesus saved to the uttermost. And then when we do, when we trust Christ, then God starts a chain of events in our lives. And he begins to put us in front of people and put us in places where we can encounter people to do his bidding, to teach and preach the gospel. The question for us today is, have we trusted Christ? And if we have, are we thinking like God? Wherever I'm at, whatever moment I'm in, I'm here for a reason. I'm not just here to pick up soup and hamburger. I'm here to be a representative of Jesus Christ. We've got to move away from, well, I'm just going through my daily stuff. No, you're just living for Christ. At least we're supposed to be. And everywhere we go, every every time we're in, we are there for Jesus. The question is, are we there for Jesus? Or are we just getting soup and hamburger? 
I don't know where you're at other than sitting here or listening. I only know where I'm at with God. So now's a good time for us to just take some time and do business with God. If our life is just soup and hamburger and not who is here for me to encounter with the gospel, we need to change our thinking and start looking at everything we do as an opportunity to minister either share the gospel, touch a life, encourage a believer, help the needy. We need to think like Christ. I love his trip to Samaria. I must needs go through Samaria. I got my grocery list. I must needs go worship the Lord and see who I can touch while I'm buying my soup and hamburger. Because surely somebody's going to be there that needs to hear about Jesus. Father, you know our needs. You know what we're doing, not doing. Things we're doing well, the things we're we're suffering, failure. You, You know all of those things. And I pray, Father, today for those who are in the fight and standing strong and and go with purpose everywhere they go, that you just strengthen them and encourage them because they're doing what you call them to do. And For those of us that that maybe aren't quite there, who aren't going thoughtfully about what we do, that that everywhere we go and every place that we're at, every time that we're at, that that we're there as your testimony and and maybe there's somebody there that we can strike up a conversation and and start a friendship that will lead to being able to give the plan of salvation or or see somebody who is truly in need, not, not somebody who's just too lazy to work, but, Father, someone who's truly in need and to minister to that need. And, and maybe, maybe Father, we don't have a lot to deal with, but maybe we can pass on that soup or the hamburger and help them out. Father, help us to be mindful of you, to think like you think, to be always aware that you are working all around us. It, we, we struggle trying to figure out what it is you want us to do, and really I think the bigger piece is we just, we just need to figure out what you're doing. You're already working all around us. We just need to be seeking how you want us to fit in your plan because you're already doing stuff. Maybe this morning, Father, someone's here who has not yet trusted Christ as their Savior, and this is the day they need to do so. This is the day they need to realize that you paid the ultimate price by giving your Son as a sacrifice. They need to put their trust in that sacrifice. They need to come to Jesus on your terms, humble and acknowledging that they are sinners and nothing to offer you but accepting Christ as their Savior. Whatever the need is, Father, we pray that you'd move in a way that only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.